We're now into the second day of mourning here in the Netherlands for Peter de Vries, the investigative crime journalist. We are appalled died by the apparently arbitrary killing of nine activists in simultaneous... Tonight, more bloodshed in Mexico. Another journalist killed this week in the country. Five he was known for fighting for the little guys, for trying to deny out corruption. From the Global Initiative Against Transnational Organized Crime, this is the Ripple Effect. This is the Ripple Effect, and I'm your host, Ana Paula Oliveira. In this episode, we guide you through the struggles environmentalists face. These people are on the front line of the climate crisis, yet they face imminent threats from other powerful forces. Who stand to gain from the attacks on environmentalists? On December 3rd, 2017, Chief Teng Datu Victor Danyan was murdered along with his two sons, son-in-law, and four other tribal members of the Tibli community in Lake Cebu, South Cotabato, Philippines. Known as the Tamasco Aid, the indigenous rights defenders opposed the use of their ancestral land by an engineering company. The refusal was ignored and the company was given permission by the Department of Environment and Natural Resources. Judy Passimiu is a coordinator for LILAC, Purple Action for Indigenous Women's Rights. They are portrayed as rebels, such as the case of the what is now known as the Tamasco Massacre. They were killed by military men, and they were identified, the 27th and 33rd Infantry Battalions. The indigenous communities have been struggling for decades against the coffee plantations in their territories. But now, it's an almost closed case because the press release is that it was a, an encounter between the rebels and the military. A record number of environmental activists were murdered last year. According Many to of these leaders don't see themselves as defenders. They Liliana Jauregui is the senior expert environmental justice from IUCN. She touches on an important factor to the story of environmentalists. Family people, but they don't identify themselves as at risk or as uh, defenders. So, Typically, we, we consider an environmentalist as anyone who takes peaceful action to protect the environment and other land rights. They are often forced into defending the natural resources and way of life against industry like mining, logging, large-scale agriculture, and others. Though some of these people may not use the language environmentalists, their proximity to these projects makes them more likely to clash with political, business, and sometimes criminal interests who collude to exploit natural resources. Judy tells us more about the situation environmentalists face in the Philippines. More than 50% of the mining concessions are within the ancestral domains of the indigenous peoples. Corporate plantations are within ancestral domains of indigenous peoples. The two major mega dams that are being uh, pushed by the Duterte government are within the ancestral domains of indigenous peoples. And so it has become an obligation of sorts of the indigenous peoples to defend their lands from all of these onslaughts and from all of these attacks against their ancestral territories. Land grabbing is happening by these corporations in very insidious ways, using legal mechanisms, but also in some parts of Mindanao, in the southern part of the Philippines. Land grabbing is done by paramilitary groups so that they themselves can sell the lands to these corporations. In previous episodes, we have drawn attention to the collusion between state officials, companies, and organized crime, who encourage harm against journalists, human rights defenders, and is particularly prominent in the case of environmentalists. Indigenous people often find themselves confronted with large-scale projects on their doorsteps. Corporations and companies usually bypass real forms of consultation with the community, and this puts environmentalists at odds with powerful figures. Communities have to know their rights, including their right to say no. This may not necessarily prevent conflicts and will probably cost more, because those who stand up for their rights are those who have been consistently attacked, maligned, harassed. But knowing their rights gives them confidence and therefore are able to assert these rights. 
Another factor that experts have drawn attention to is criminalization of those who are defending the environment. A piece of legislation was introduced in the Philippines in 2020 by the Duterte administration. The Anti-Terrorism Act was designed to counter and prohibit terrorism in the country, but the broad definition of terrorism has resulted in controversial actions. A lot of discretion is left to the state enforcers on what are suspected acts of terrorism, even intent or inciting, all of these actions or perceived intent could be a basis of arrest. And so this has chilling effect. During lockdown, ordinary citizens, students who would express disappointments, anger, criticisms would be visited by the National Bureau of Investigation in their homes or by the village police. With the Anti-Terror Act, it institutionalizes red tagging. In the last Senate hearing, senators have asked members of the military regarding uh, red tagging. And red tagging is a tactic used by some governments against those who do not fully agree with its actions. They are tagged as communists or terrorists, labels which open them up to persecution. Randy Echanis, a 72-year-old peasant leader, was brutally killed in his home. A 39-year-old mother, Zara Alvarez, a human rights defender working in the province, was shot to death. Both of them were on a terrorist list issued by the Duterte government two years ago, containing more than 600 names, a lot of which are names of indigenous people's leaders, active even at the international level. And so this law legitimizes red tagging and killing of human rights defenders. This law institutionalizes state impunity. The murder of environmentalists creates a ripple effect in societies around the world, especially where rule of law is weak and convictions for assassinations are few and far between. But it doesn't start with murder. Rachel Cox, campaigner and investigations at Global Witness, goes a little bit deeper on this issue. It's important to look at who is being systematically attacked as a result of uh, land and environmental activism. So Global Witness has been collecting data specifically on killings of land environmental activists, which is the, the sharp end of attacks. We know that that's not the only threats that they face. And, and before they're killed, many activists uh, experience criminalization, surveillance, tied up in the judicial system in order to keep them from speaking out. But what we do know is that from Global Witnesses data is that consistently a large number of the victims or land environmental defenders who are attacked and killed, most, almost 40%, almost consistently year on year tend to belong to indigenous communities. Environmentalists around the world face multiple threats from networks of corporations, government officials and criminal gangs colluding for natural resources. The harassment and assassinations are monitored by civil society like the Global Initiative, Global Witness and others. But there is a consistent effort by some governments to delegitimize their work. We see this in the case of the Tamasco 8, where their murder was spun as a clash with rebels. The victims were wrongly labeled as New People's Army members. Judy explains the dangers these narratives can have. These are not considered assassinations. They spin the killings as a common crime, robbery or crime of passion even. Or in the indigenous communities, they declare it as tribal wars because they use indigenous peoples as paramilitary forces or they use the traditional warrior structure of the indigenous peoples and they pit them against each other. So it's never about the killings of environmentalists. Unless the government recognizes that the peoples are actually environmentalists, are actually human rights defenders, then the crimes against them will never be considered as such and that the crimes against them will never be resolved and prevented. In the case of assassinations of environmentalists, there is a clear role played by corporations, state embedded actors and organized crime. This is a familiar pattern seen in many parts of the world where natural resources are abundant. Join us in the next episode as we look at the practical steps governments and corporations can take to promote peace and communication with environmentalists and ultimately prevent assassinations. 
If you enjoy the ripple effect, please share and subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. Upon release of this episode, the administration in the Philippines has changed. In June 2022, Ferdinand Bong Bong Marcos replaced Rodrigo Duterte as the new president of the Philippines. Whether the new administration used anti-terror law and red tagging as a weapon against critics is yet to be seen.